My name is Jennifer Ocker. I'm the General Atlantic Professor of Marketing at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and I authored the book, The Dragonfly Effect. I'm Andy Smith. Uh, I'm a principal of Vona Vona Ventures, and I also authored The Dragonfly Effect. The website we, we built to complement the book is actually, we think of that as being the, the dynamic living uh, aspect uh, a, after the dragonfly effect the book is published. Necessarily a book is, is a static work, um, but this is by no means a, a, a static effort. As we started doing the research, we, we came across story after story. In fact, it was a real challenge um, to, put, to, to close the book in the sense of, of stopping writing it because there were so many, um, so many fascinating stories and examples we came across, even some that, that had been influenced by the fact that we were writing this in the first place. And so the site, the site is meant to, is to be that living, current testimony and toolkit. It's, um, it's designed to make it so that if someone reads the book and wants to get inspired or wants to get um, uh, a, a better handle on how to approach something, they can find it there, either among the the, the tools and the resources we have posted there ourselves that are derivatives of the book or out of a contribution other co community members uh, will have made uh, that are going to be much more current than the things that, that, uh, that started out. We, we hope it to be uh, very much a, a testament to the power of, of the social network itself in that it will always remain um, up to date, it won't be static, and that um, people will can continue to improve upon it uh, well, beyond, well beyond what we started. One of the most powerful stories from, from the book is uh, the story of the Nike Wii portal. And it is um, uh, one where Nike sought to take the already vibrant spirit of volunteerism and giving back among its employees and turn it into something even more. Um, and what was relatively unique in how they approached it was they sought to centralize, but centralize and then get, get out of the way as, as an organization. To, to set a little context, um, about as of, as of a year ago, Nike had four separate employee um, giving spaces, basically. Each were organized around, around the uh, four major locations for where Nike employees were. And each um, worked in their own way, but they didn't share anything among them. They didn't build uh, a, a sense of unity within the company. And the people in the department that oversaw this at the corporate level saw that there were missed opportunities. And so what they created was they created a, 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 global, a global marketplace for giving back that respected both the, individual, the individual's um, interests in giving back different ways and cultural aspects of it too. So for instance, they found that in studying this, that uh, employees in their European operations tended to think of giving back or contributing to the community as something you did with your neighbors, perhaps helping them build a barn. Uh, whereas uh, in the United States, we may think of it more the way we're comfortable with it here is that uh, giving financially to charity or to giving to the less fortunate. But as they looked at the company worldwide, they saw that each of these things were equally valuable um, in the communities in which they participated. So they created a platform that allowed those, those things both to coexist. Additionally, they looked deeper at how people thought about uh, giving back and how could, how could the um, employee base really become you know, a, a dynamic part of the community in a, in a more fundamental way than perhaps a conventional idea of corporate social responsibility. And they divided the way people could give back into four different pillars. One was the one, um, one was the way you would think of more generally giving back financially or giving time volunteering at an organization. But then they also came up with two other pillars. One was uh, to uh, give back expertise. So for instance, if you have, if you're an employee with a particular design skill, you would be targeted for, um, for opportunities that require design skill or um, giving voice. So another, another pillar was that in this era of, of social media or in uh, community involvement, some people have a dramatically more power to influence than others. And they looked at that as an equal opportunity for employees to, to contribute. And so with those four pillars and a respect 
for uh, globally different approaches to giving back, they really catalyzed and did indeed live up to their goal of, of creating a, a, a vehicle or a marketplace for opportunities uh, for, for employees to, to contribute and got out of the way at the same time as an organization. And then I guess another set of organizations that we profile that I'm particularly proud of are my students. We have um, a set of students here at the Stanford MBA program that incubate their own companies that um, integrate in a social good goal with a for-profit motive and then spin out organizations out of, out of the Stanford Business School, out of classes here. Uh, there's, there's some that are... Uh, uh, some students who are taking classes in the D school, and there's others that are taking GSB-based classes, and what they're creating is really quite remarkable. And as they design these businesses for network effects, they design for openness, you can see some of these efforts get more and more traction. Another example that we're really proud of is our kids <laughs> who built lemonade stands based on principles of the dragonfly effect, or, for example, built... Um, and a paper airplane company this, um, this uh, summer, uh, Devin, our eight-year-old, did. And he made $1,000 for a charity of his choice, as did Cooper, as did Taya Sloan. So this idea that you can take these principles, which are very basic, and allow them to infect the, the lives of others who don't know very much about business, like two eight-year-olds and a four-year-old, is pretty exciting. Um, so one goal that we have is to, um, in the spirit of Samir and um, what, in fact, Samir's friends and family started, is we're trying to work toward um, an India bone marrow registry, the opportunity to um, have this incredible problem that exists right now, which is um, if you're Southeast Asian or a minority in general, and you get leukemia, the opportunity to find a bone marrow match is very limited. Uh, so what we try and do in the next three to four months is to make inroads on the specific goal of getting 100,000 individuals into the bone marrow registry, uh, preferably those individuals being minority or Southeast Asian in particular. And we'll be working with Stanford University, the Haas Center, along with Open IDEO, um, and, um, and we're designing this for network effects as well. So corporations and for-profits that are involved include Be The Match as well as Rotary International and, um, and then Open IDEO. So we'll be working to hopefully arm students here at Stanford with the templates, the tools, the models that allow self-empowerment to happen and for them to help make, um, make a dent in this very specific goal, which is 100,000 individuals into the bone marrow registry with the larger goal of um, giving more fuel to the fledgling efforts that are already being made in India in the bone marrow registry and the cord blood arena right now. I'd say another thing that we're, we're working towards is that you know, looking at this methodology is something that, that anyone can apply. And um, beyond the individuals, beyond the inherently not-for-profit institutions, there's a, a huge opportunity for, for profit-oriented institutions to, to take, this, take this effect and help, it, help them achieve their goals with it. As we've seen, social media has changed the way we understand pretty much everything, and everyone is scrambling to uh, figure out what its impact is on its markets and their customers there's, there's a, uh, a chance for companies to, to take on um, a dragonfly effect process and figure out uh, with some soul searching, you know, what is it, what's their mission? What is it they believe in? And how can they orient themselves towards a goal that other people will take on um, in, in support of, uh, you know, that they can share? One example that, that we use uh, in thinking about this as a for-profit example is, is the example of Google. Uh, Google has uh, got a, a tight mission around, um, you know, uh, maybe, maybe it's no longer their specific mission around doing no evil, but also of indexing the world's uh, information and creating, creating good as a result. 
one, one thing along the way that, that people have, have um, uh, noticed is that Google consumes a significant portion of the world's information, or at least the, or the world's information of the world's power uh, in power in its data centers. And so, um, you know, being, a, being an organization that, that believes in, in good, that was probably pretty troubling to them. And so, one action they've taken is to offset that impact. And we've seen that as a, as a common and positive example uh, in a couple of different in a couple of different companies, but but what Google did was not just put solar panels on its roof and not just have uh, the founders start driving Priuses, but invested in the primary technology for renewable energy, um, actually to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of getting power from the sun, uh, with a direct with a direct idea that it offsets uh, some of the consumption that they have. Um, another example of a company that did that successfully was Starbucks. Starbucks is a huge, uh, a huge buyer of coffee worldwide and also a huge consumer of, of paper and, and disposable cups. They took a two-pronged approach to, to improving their, their profile and getting closer to what their customers and their employees believed in by, uh, by making a move to endorse the fair trade program and buying only fair trade grown beans to, improve, to ensure that the lives of the people who actually made and grew Starbucks coffee uh, was in line with the, their values as a company, uh, as providing a, a good place for people to work, whether they work directly for the Starbucks organization or they work in somewhere in that supply chain. Um, additionally, on, on the consumable side, they invested in a leading edge uh, recyclable content um, so that when you think about buying, buying Starbucks um, and you think about the fact that you're going to be throwing away this paper cup, having the knowledge that that um, a fair amount or a leading amount of it uh, is, is, uh, is recovered from previous use is, is a powerful instance.